went to, uh, I, got, I called Credo Mutwa, the Zulu shaman, mm. um, and I didn't say to him, look, this is what I'm thinking here as I was putting this together. I just said to him, can you, can you tell me any um, African legends about the moon? First of all, there are African tribes, as there are in other parts of the world, that say our tribe goes back to before when the moon came, before the moon came. But um, also, he said to me, well, the, the Zulu legend of the moon is it's, it's an egg. And of course, anthropologists immediately hear that or whatever. Mm -hmm. They go, that's crazy. You're, you're primitive. Yeah. But why do they say it's an egg? It's living. Because they say it was hollowed out. Right. And it was hollowed out far, far away in the distant cosmos by um, reptilian entities and in the Zulu legends words rolled across the heavens to the earth where it caused great cataclysmic events. Now you move that big thing, that bugger in here um, and you're going to do tremendous damage to the earth certainly initially because everything moves and you look at these, these ancient uh, legends all over the world they talk about a golden age, a, a previous age of, 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 of great human expansion and possibility coming to an end with cataclysmic events, massive earthquakes, a tidal wave uh, that went across the earth and the fact the earth moved. All these different cultures around the world in different uh, ways describe the same thing. It's mentioned in the Sanskrit, the Gita, the Bible, the Torah, the Sumerian tablets. Yeah. You, you mentioned um, Credo Mutua when you were talking about the folklore. You were also a part of, uh, <clears throat> you know, this understanding of the Necklace of Mysteries yeah. that was explaining this. Can you explain that a little bit for us? Well, I met Credo Mutua in 1996, 97, 98, or a, a, across that period. I met him about two or three times. We became very close friends. And uh, he's been in the underground um, shamanistic network in Africa for much of his life. He's coming up to his 90th year, I mean, yeah. way back. And he's had access to information that has been passed on in, in basically in secret because these networks were created when the Europeans came in, the British overwhelmingly, and they... Um, targeted the shamans, targeted the knowledge. They didn't want that knowledge to continue. They wanted to, to, to destroy it. They used Christianity to replace it, uh, as they did in many, many countries around the world, and they targeted the shaman. They didn't want this information to, to, to be passed on, so it went underground. And when I met him, um, he was already, you know, uh, quite an age. And because uh, in America or in places like that, people have had the ability to go through this uh, material dream of success and found it wanting and now they're looking for something else. In so many developing countries, including South Africa um, and other parts of Africa, they haven't taken that to the point where it's like um, found wanting. It's still the dream. It's still the, the thing that, that, that is the symbol of success, like the Western uh, model with the, with the Nike trainers and all that stuff. Um, and so the knowledge that Credo's been carrying, I mean, a lot of people it, it, uh, of his own people have been turning away from it, and he's been looking for ways to pass it on. And he reached the point where he said, the situation in the world's got to such a stage, never mind passing it on in secret, it's got to get out there. And, um, you know, I've, I've helped him do that uh, to an extent by giving him a, a, a platform. And he shared so much with me. And... You know, people have looked at the Native Americans, they've looked at the, uh, the South Americans, the Central Americans, like the Mayans and stuff like that, and they've looked in Asia and, 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 and other parts of the world, and what's so been neglected, forgotten, is Africa. Yeah. And Africa has the most unbelievable gifts of knowledge, both of history and other things, to give us. And there's this man sitting there who, he's a library on legs. And, and so he's like, uh, talk about pe uh, some force handing me pieces in the puzzle. Yeah. <laughs> so one day they came along and went, have that one, mate. Yeah. And it was Kredo Mutwa. And, and he's been incredibly helpful to me. It was important enough for even him to be withheld and they stole the Necklace of Mysteries? Yeah, the Necklace of the Mysteries he first showed me um, when I first met him. 
it, it's called a necklace, but it goes on your, your shoulders. Right. And from, <clears throat> coming from it, and it's ever so heavy, how this guy, his age, walks around with it, and, and another <clears throat> one like it called the, following enough, the necklace of the moons, because they say there are many moons which aren't actually, you know, what they seem to be. And um, f hanging from it are um, symbols which he uses and others before him, because it's about a thousand years old, he reckons at least, um, uh, he uses to tell the story of not just Africa, but the world. And right at the front, prior to place, is a human woman and a clearly not human entity. Um, right. And shall we say they fit together um, uh, sexually, shall we say. Mm. And um, he said, that's there on the necklace, in pride of place, right at the front, because he's talking about the, the, the legends of the interbreeding between a non-human race mm -hmm. and humans to create not just a hybrid bloodline, which became, as I've been writing about for years, these Illuminati bloodlines like the Rothschilds and the Rockefellers, the British royal family, passed through history, these hybrids, these demigods, these people that see themselves as a genetically and in any, every, every other way elite uh, and right. above the rest of the population. Entitled. But also, um, the human race in general was genetically tinkered with. Sure. And uh, it seems to me, the more I put this together, and it's an ongoing thing, it's gone on since I finished the book, of course, I mean, that's what I do, that there's a modus operandi here whereby these moons are brought in to a target planet. And it's very much, it's very, very much symbolized by the Death Star um, theme in the Star, Star Wars, Wars movies. Yeah. Of course, produced by a massive insider called George Lucas. Um, but they move these moons in, and when that happens, the target planet's status quo, society, way of life, it's gone because of the effect of the planet of what happens. And then when everything starts to die down and, 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 and uh, settle down, they then go to phase two, which is um, changing the, uh, the form, in this case the human form, changing the way that society works so it becomes a slave race and a slave society um, serving this um, control system. And um, what's coming more and more into my research is Saturn. And what Saturn's very famous for, of course, is the number of moons it has. And um, I would strongly suggest that um, we need to look at that from a new light as well. What are they really? And, you know, I know that um, some people have pointed in the past and, and more recently to the fact that Phobos, the, the moon of Mars, is um, hollow and is a, a construct. Mm -hmm. And just before I came out here, Robert, we've got a, a, an astronomy, mainstream science astronomy program um, in Britain. Well, I think it's one of the most long-running programs in the world, maybe the longest running. It's called The Sky at Night. And uh, they had a guy on there who was uh, talking about the fact, I think it's the European Express um, spacecraft, um, has been doing uh, close um, photographing of Phobos. And they've concluded that um, it's very possibly hollow. And it's made of nothing like they've ever found any right. meteorite or, 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 or asteroid to be, to be made of. And um, uh, a number of times over the years, uh, people have, I think Richard Hoagland's talked about it more recently, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That, that that's not actually what it seems to be. It's some kind of craft. And all I'm saying is that's actually not a one-off. It's a, a modus operandi. No. And that's just in the sky, the moon, our moon, is just a massive version of it. And, and when you talk about the size of it, um, you know, it's been postulated that we've been, by, by, by scientists over the years that if you, um, if you look at the Earth's magnetic field and the size of the Earth, it, it, it could well be that the Earth wouldn't have a satellite. And if it did, it would be a small one. That's right. 2,160 miles around. It's bigger than Pluto. Um, and some scientists don't even talk about a planet-satellite-moon relationship, but a dual-planet relationship. Right. And then you talk to um, insiders over the years um, who, who 
been into some of these inner projects. And one of the things that, that, that you pick up as a theme is that when they talk about spacecraft that they've seen or pictures of, it's the size of them. And again, we go back to what I was just talking about. We've got to expand our uh, perception of possibility out of the box that says we can't do it so it can't be done into the, the, the understanding that because of the way humanity has been suppressed and, uh, and, and, and kept down and kept ignorant, we are nothing, nothing like the cutting edge of possibility. So to dismiss something because we can't do it is fine. That's a choice. Good luck to you. Let's have a beer. But you're going to miss the point if you do.